Hello and welcome to the National Association of Plant Breeders webinar series, How to Breed New Plant Varieties, Imagining and Engineering Crops. My name is David Francis and I will be serving as your host today. This is a special presentation presented by Dr. Kate Evans of Washington State University. The title of her presentation is Making Appealing Apples. She will be describing apple breeding techniques, both old and new, as well as current practice in her program at Washington State University. Dr. Evans was awarded the Women's Leadership Through Science Award in 2011. She is actively involved in horticultural associations from Washington State to the United Kingdom. She is experienced in the design and implementation of crossing programs, seedling selection, and screening and selection for disease resistance. In addition, her program has emphasized selection for fruit quality in apple. With a warm welcome, I'm now going to switch control of the screen over to our speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to add Apple into this series of webinars. My talk today is going to be split into three parts. So I'm going to start with some background. Um, and what I'm going to concentrate today is uh, more specifically about dessert apples, but some of the background that I'm going to go through is applicable to pretty much all Malus species. So, apple is a member of the Rosaceae, um, and the Rosaceae includes many of the, the fruits and nuts that we all like to eat, as well as obviously rose and some other ornamentals. Apple has a basic chromosome number of 17, and that's not like most of the rest of the rosaceae. Typically, rosaceae have fewer chromosomes. And we have a draft genome of uh, apple. It was published in 2010. Um, and from that genome, we could see that apple is an auto polyploid. And it appears that it's had a relatively recent duplication of the genome and then aneuploidization. And apple varieties are typically diploid. But if you start screening through selected varieties and um, germplasm collections, you'll find that there are really quite a lot of triploids out there. Um, they've been selected, I think, predominantly because of fruit size. Triploids are typically bigger. And so uh, a surprisingly large number of triploids are around. As a cultivated species, we think that apple came predominantly from uh, Malus saversii, from Kazakhstan in Central Asia. In this, in this area, there are still wild forests of Malus saversii. And it's been the, the target of a number of different collecting trips by several different people over the last few decades. So there is Malus saversii, uh, a, a sort of spread over, over the world um, into germplasm collections recently, as well as, um, as, the, as the origin of the species. And I've just put a reference at the bottom of the screen there to a, a nice article that explains how we think apple uh, came to be uh, uh, the popular fruit that it is today. So, uh, apple trees do not come true to type from seed. Now, many of us as kids have at some point tried to grow an apple tree from a pip. Um, it's one of those things that uh, is, the, the pips are very easy, easily accessible. Um, but if you've ever had one of these trees that actually has come to fruit, it's often really disappointing. So you do not get, for example, a Granny, Trith, Granny Smith tree from a pip from a Granny Smith apple. So uh, Johnny Appleseed did a great job at spreading apple seeds around the US. But most of what uh, resulted actually fed into the production of hard cider and not dessert apples. So apple trees are vegetatively propagated um, commercially and also at various points in the breeding program when we want to multiply up our selections. So how do we do this? 
An apple tree is made up of two parts. It has the cyan variety, and that's the aerial fruiting part. So typically all those varieties that you know, the Gala, the Granny Smith, the Honeycrisp, Red Delicious, they're cyan varieties. And then there's also a rootstock, which is the non-fruiting part of the tree. And typically the rootstock is more than just the root system below the ground. It also is uh, a few inches above the ground, um, say eight inches or so, depending on who you talk to. Um, and you can clearly see on any apple tree where the union has been made. The trees are propagated um, in a nursery and usually it's done by taking a bud, um, I think you can see here just a, a bud on a small section of, of cyan, cutting a notch into a rootstock and then matching up the cambium layers of the two. What then happens is that the, the cambium layers fuse, the bud of the cyan variety grows out, and that becomes the, the tree trunk, the central leader. And then the, the top part of the rootstock is just cut off. So the rootstock can affect many aspects of the tree. Um, the illustration here shows what we typically think of most when we're thinking of the rootstock effect, um, vigor. And the, the illustration shows a range of different rootstocks of, that trees are all the same age, they all have the same cyan variety propagated onto the rootstock. But you can see as you go from uh, left through to right, bottom right, the, the range of vigor <clears throat> going from the most dwarfing M27 through to the, the more vigorous ones down at the bottom there. Typically, M9, the second most dwarfing one there, is the, the commercial size of tree. But what, what the range in rootstocks enables the grower to do is to choose a, a tree vigor that's more suitable for their own growing environments. So when choosing the variety and the tree to plant, a grower not only has to take into account the cyan, but also the rootstock. And the rootstock can impart other other um, traits, it can have resistances to diseases or pests, um, and also it can affect how soon the tree starts to produce bloom and fruit, so in other words it's precocity. And some of these rootstocks will induce uh, precocious fruit, uh, so typically the, the more dwarfing rootstocks will, will start to, to, will produce trees that have fruit sooner than the more vigorous trees. I've just put a link at the bottom of that page to a really nice seminar that Gennaro Fazio, the USDA apple rootstock breeder, um, put together. So anybody who wants to learn a little bit more about rootstocks, um, I suggest you, you watch that seminar. Apples have gametophytic self incompatibility and therefore they're outcrosses. So simplistically that means that pollen from variety X will not pollinate variety X. So from a commercial perspective that means that you need to have a pollinizer variety in your orchard. And so that also, you know, if you have an apple tree in your backyard, you need another apple tree in order to pollinate it. When you're choosing your pollinizer variety, you have to take into account two different things there are more than 29 reported self-incompatibility alleles in apple. So in other words, you have to make sure that um, the variety that you choose is compatible to your main variety. And then also you have to be, you have to take into account when the varieties will bloom. Because bloom on a tree can spread over several weeks in any one location. So uh, it's important both from a commercial perspective and also, you know, any any uh, amateur growers out there, you have to think quite carefully about which variety you choose as your pollinizer. And this obviously impacts um, what we do in the breeding program as well. So the second part of my talk is going to focus on breeding targets and also an uh, outline of how we actually do hybridization in apple. What I've done for the breeding targets is to split them into three different areas. 
And the first one, which in my opinion is the most important, is fruit quality. So appearance and eating quality, uh, I think, have to be the most important fruit quality breeding traits. As far as appearance is concerned, consumers go out there and they're faced with a range of apple types on display whenever they go into a store. And they, they have to be drawn to a particular apple, uh, and that's really by its appearance. So they're shopping by eye. And over and above that, predominantly in this country, in the US, um, consumers can go in there and actually select individual fruit and then put them into a bag and pay and leave the shop. But what that means is that there, there can be a lot of picking over of the fruit display. And it's important for retailers that there isn't a lot of waste after that happens. So some varieties will and do show marks and bruises more than others. Some are just a little more robust. So all of those kind of things, in my opinion, form that appearance category. So if appearance is what draws the consumer in and makes them choose that variety in the first place to buy, it's really eating quality that determines the repeat purchase. And eating quality in Apple is a interesting mix of textural qualities. So that includes crispness, hardness, um, and juiciness, as well as all of the, the flavoral components. So we look for a, a balance between acidity and sweetness. Um, obviously, some consumers prefer sweeter apples and some prefer more acidic apples. And then, of course, there's aroma on top of that. I've also included storability as a breeding target for fruit quality. When, when you uh, produce the sort of volume of apples that are produced on an annual basis uh, in somewhere like Washington State, you have to be able to store that fruit for sometimes up to 12 months of the year to ensure a, a good market uh, throughout the year. And so it's important for us that we not only breed apples that taste uh, and eat really well when they're fresh off the tree, but also apples that can maintain that kind of quality consistently throughout storage. Now, there's a lot that be, can be done with technology in, in terms of improving the storage life of apples. But fundamentally, if your apple doesn't have that, that those storage legs, if you like, in the first place, it's not going to make it. So that was my first set of, of breeding targets. The second set, production factors. I think high yield is, is self-explanatory. Um, and, and perhaps in apple it's not as important as it is in some other crops, really because you can deal a lot uh, horticulturally with yield um, in terms of tree spacing and the structure of the tree, but it's still, there still has to be a certain level of yield there um, to make it uh, a viable selection. Regular cropping can be a serious issue with apple. Some varieties, and Gala is a great example of this, um, can go into what's called a, a biennial cycle. And that means that one year they'll produce a huge crop of very small apples, and then that's followed by a year with almost no crop. Obviously, that's neither of those years work really well for the grower. You can manage it uh, horticulturally again to a certain extent by thinning the fruit but that's expensive and labor intensive. And so if we can select um, varieties that are more regular cropping and are less likely to go into this biennial bearing cycle, um, we will be more successful. And then the third uh, production factor I've put in there is uh, cold tolerance and winter chill. Two kind of different things, but I've, I've linked them together here. Cold tolerance, obviously, for some areas where um, it's very difficult to grow many standard varieties of apple just because the winters are, are so cold. Uh, for example, Minnesota, and, and in fact, cold tolerance is a breeding target of the University of Minnesota breeding program. And then winter chill, I guess the opposite, 
where there just isn't enough uh, chilling uh, to produce or to make the tree produce fruit buds. So in some areas, uh, and uh, for example South Africa, where they're facing warmer weather and fewer hours of winter chill, the developing new varieties that have a lower requirement for winter chill is really important. So my third and final set of breeding targets I've grouped together as resistances. Um, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but they're kind of resistances. Um, the first two, apple scab and powdery mildew, were both fungal diseases. Certainly apple scab, uh, breeding for resistance to apple scab, is one of the primary targets of almost every apple breeding program around the world, um, probably except mine. Um, and that is one, one of the reasons uh, is that in Washington, where we have such low humidity, we don't have um, much of a problem really with apple scab. However, in most other areas, it really is a serious issue. Powdery mildew is certainly um, around pretty much everywhere where you grow apples, uh, including Washington, but perhaps not, a, a not at the sort of levels that it would be in many of the, for example, European production areas. Fire blight is a, a bacterial disease and can be devastating in the orchard. It, uh, a serious infection can leave you with trees that just look as if they've been burnt, hence the name. Uh, and certainly we have it here and it, and it is in most areas, most production areas of the world. Um, when I grouped together my resistances I also put sunburn in here. Now it's obviously not a disease but it is important in some areas to have some resistance to sunburn. Um, and you know, I put this in really because here I am in Washington where sunburn can be a, a serious issue to apple production. One of the things that we find with sunburn is that um, unfortunately the, the apples don't get a chance to acclimatize to the level of light as, they, as they're growing. Um, what, what tends to happen is as the fruit gets larger and heavier, it usually means makes the branch bend, so it changes the position of the of the fruit on the tree, and therefore sometimes you can get a high a sudden high impact of of light, high intensity light, onto what can be a relatively mature apple, and so you'll find uh, sometimes the the symptoms that you can see in the photograph. Um, and so for, for a breeding target for my program, uh, trying to find um, and select individuals that are resistant to sunburn is, is really quite important. So I'm going to move on to hybridization and how we actually cross, uh, how we make crosses in Apple now. Um, I think hopefully you can see from the, the diagram there that Apple has a, a relatively simple flower structure. It has a flower number of five, so everything is in multiples of five, which I think most people realize when they cut open the apple and get that, that five-pointed star in the middle. Um, if you look at the photograph on the top right-hand side, uh, this stage that's circled here in, in red is the, the stage of bud that we use for um, pretty much all of the crossing. We call that the popcorn stage. And really, it, it means that the, the, the bud is sort of fully swollen and just at the point before the petals start to open. So hopefully there's been uh, no insect already visiting that flower and bringing in stray pollen. So to collect the pollen, we use a, a pretty simple setup. Uh, the photograph on the bottom right shows a, a wire mesh over a Petri dish. We go out and harvest a whole load of these flower buds and then you can just rub them across the wire mesh. The anthers typically detach from the filaments and fall through the wire mesh into the Petri dish and then you can discard everything else. And then if you leave that Petri dish out at room temperature, typically overnight or perhaps uh, two nights, then the anthers will dehiss and you'll get a fair amount of pollen there in your Petri dish. One nice thing about working with apple is that the pollen is fairly robust. 
Uh, you can store it in the Petri dish if you choose, uh, but typically in my program we transfer pollen into these glass vials, as you can see there on the bottom left. Just makes it sort of easier um, to store and uh, doesn't take up as much room, and we can uh, take them out into the field a little bit uh, more easily. Plus then if you drop them on the floor, they have a lid on and you don't lose all your pollen. The, the pollen can store in the freezer for several years. Typically we'll put it in a box with some desiccant. I've fairly successfully used pollen that's five years old. I haven't really pushed it much beyond that, but uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it wouldn't last a little bit longer if needed. So to prepare the mother, um, we actually use uh, the same stage of bloom. You can see the picture on the top left shows um, the what, what we're doing is to remove all of the outer whorls of the flower, just leaving behind the stigmas. Um, we remove the petals predominantly because they form otherwise the, the principal target for the visiting insects. But if we remove the sepals as well, um, and it can be quite easy to do that just with your fingers, you can sort of pop the whole of the, the top of the bloom off. Uh, it really helps when you come back to try and um, identify which apples have been hand pollinated and which ones um, have not later on in the season. And I, hopefully you can see by that um, those odd looking apples down at the bottom right hand side, what an apple looks like um, when you've removed the sepals at, at pollination, so you get this sort of just the, the empty uh, cal calyx end as opposed to the, the typical um, apple. Now you can get, and I have used in the past, uh, pollinating scissors that will uh, you can adapt by just cutting a small notch into both the blades and using them to cut around the, the, the uh, bud to remove all of these outer whorls. But from my experience, they haven't worked all that well in apple because the, the bud size tends to vary from one variety to the next. So when you've removed those outer whorls, you get left with uh, this sort of sad looking um, cluster of, of blooms that you can see on the top right hand side there with the, pretty much the very exposed stigmas. That's all you've got left. Um, we usually pollinate about three per cluster. And we'll come and we'll repollinate uh, on the second day as well as, as um, when we're preparing them, just to make sure that we've got good pollen receptivity. And you can see uh, from the bottom left photo that we just can use a paintbrush or more often than not now we use the eraser on the end of a pencil to pollinate. Um, it just gives you a little bit of extra reach sometimes um, and the, the pollen sticks nicely onto the, the eraser. So it's a fairly simple process, um, but of course, for the most part, when we're crossing, we're using trees that are out in the orchard. Um, that in itself is uh, can be problematic. Obviously, when we've prepared blooms and left these stigmas exposed, they're exposed to all the weather conditions um, that are out there, very, very sensitive to any frost and also to any wind damage. And of course, uh, although that's one level of uh, controlling the crossing, it's not um, not totally controlled. We could still get visiting insects. Um, I've just illustrated here some of the other methods of control. You could, of course, just put a bag around the cluster, as it as as I showed it on the previous photograph, um, or you could use a larger bag. The photograph that you can see on the left there is a, a whole branch that's been bagged. Um, anybody who is particularly sharp-eyed might notice that that's a cherry rather than an apple tree in there. Um, I just couldn't find that apple photo. Um, but it's exactly the same for cherry. So uh, you can get these pollinating bags that are slightly porous and allow gas exchange and will protect the, the pollinated blooms uh, for as long as you need them on the tree. You can of course go uh, one stage beyond that and protect the whole tree um, and here the, the picture in the middle there you can see is a, a single tree that's that's netted um, or even beyond that um, and, and net a whole row of trees in which case you need a, a more substantial structure uh, the one that you can see on the bottom right there. 
Um, and, and this is the sort of thing that if you're using trees that are on a trellis, uh, so in other words, they're supported by posts with wires in between them, uh, you often have to resort to that full uh, netting of a row if you want to, to um, totally control the hybridization. So then once you've, you've got to that point, you just really have to sit back and wait for the, wait for the fruit to grow. And then it's as simple as cutting the fruit in half, as you can see in the, the top right, taking out the seeds, washing the seeds, and then stratifying them on damp filter paper in a Petri dish for about 12 weeks before they'll start to germinate. And apple seeds are pretty robust as well. You can store them uh, relatively indefinitely. Um, uh, and then, uh, it, so if you need to to bulk up if you if you can't make a, a large number of seeds in one year on a particular cross and you want to add more until you have sufficient seed. So uh, that moves me into the third part of my talk, uh, which is more specifically about uh, my breeding program at Washington State University. So Washington produces around about 55 to 60 percent of the US crop. Um, however, the breeding program only started here in 1994, and that's, um, okay, that's 20 years ago now, but in, in apple breeding terms, that's still pretty recent, and when you compare it to many of the apple breeding programs around the world, um, we're still in the, in the juvenile stage. <laughs> so I have here a schema of my breeding program, um, and when, when the comments that I was making about us being in the juvenile phase uh, at 20 years, I, I think you can probably see here that typically we expect the program to go through about 18 years to, to produce a, a variety that's, that's ready for release. So you can see the length of time that it takes to produce a new variety. Certainly one that's thoroughly tested anyway. So I've described uh, previously pollination and then uh, seed collecting. After we've stratified our, fruit, our seeds, rather, we um, pot them into compost in the greenhouse and then um, we can do some testing in the greenhouse for some key diseases, for example fire blight or powdery mildew, and, and obviously many people would do apple scab screening at that stage as well. My program uses a, a rootstock to, to help us to move through the, the juvenile phase of the apple tree. If you leave an apple seedling on its own roots, you might be waiting 10 years or more before you get bloom and fruit. And so by using a precocious rootstock, um, and we use the M9 rootstock, we can push through juvenility a little bit faster. The other thing that it does is it produces for us a, a more um, consistent tree uh, that is relatively dwarfed, so we don't have to put in a massive amount of effort on pruning, and we can cram a lot of trees into a relatively small space. So uh, my program sends seedlings to the nursery, um, a commercial nursery works with us, and we, and we get back trees that are on M9 rootstock. We then go through three different phases of selection um, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of those phases in a bit more detail in a few minutes. We also now have been doing DNA informed breeding at WSU for uh, a number of years. The first, uh, that first red star at the beginning is to remind me that we, the most important thing is marker-assisted parent selection, um, and, and certainly in terms of, of my mind when we're talking about DNA-informed breeding. And we've been doing um, parent selection this way for about seven years now. And the thing that, that I really like about it is that it gives you an ability to make uh, a more efficient design for your crosses, because not only then are you taking into account all the phenotypic information that you've got about parents, you also can add in any uh, genotypic information um, and allelic information that you've got. 
the second star is uh, the second stage that we've been applying DNA informed breeding and that's marker assisted seedling selection and we've been doing that for now for about five years in the program and this I've been doing in collaboration with my colleague Cameron Peace. He runs WSU's Tree Fruit Genotyping Lab over on the main campus in Pullman. Um, and one of the things that I was really keen to do when I started to, to bring in uh, this technology into the program was to, uh, to try and make it as robust as possible, not just over the markers, but how robust could we be, how confident could we be that when we get data back from the lab, uh, we, we can be pretty sure which seedling it's relating to. Um, it's all a matter of logistics and labeling and um, when you're culling a seedling, any decision obviously then is terminal. Once that seedling's gone, it's gone and you can't come back in a couple of weeks and say, oh, I, I think, think that was a mistake and actually it was seedling A we needed to call, not seedling B. So one thing that we've done is to develop a system that is relatively robust um, in terms of our data transfer. We have a, a sample collection system, which is the photograph you can see on the bottom right hand side there with a, a typical 96 well tube set up. Um, we can sample just a small piece of leaf tissue into these tubes. Uh, what we wanted to do was to was to develop a system where our seedlings form uh, are in the same format, and so we have now a a 96 plant seedling system uh, that matches our our collection system um, exactly. And so now we can collect uh, straight from uh, the position seedling A1 into the selection tube A1. Um, the other end of this is that when we get our data back from the lab, we also get it in a spreadsheet, which is, is the, the 96 well plate uh, format. And so it's very easy then to just stand there with our, the, the plate map um, that you can see there at the bottom with the, the red and the green squares um, and, and accurately pick out the seedlings that we want to cull. So that has kind of really helped my confidence in, um, in our ability to, to do this, this testing in the program. So what are we actually testing with? Well, in Apple, there are a lot of markers that have been identified that are linked to resistances to pests and diseases, but we don't really have very many for fruit quality. Um, and certainly, when you go back just a, a few years, we were really stuck with um, just a couple of markers, one for fruit skin color, and one for ethylene regulation. When you work with something that is a tree fruit, it's, it's really important, I think, to have some of these tools that are linked specifically to the fruit quality because we have to wait for the fruit, even, even using our dwarfing precocious rootstocks, we're waiting five or six years for the fruit. And that fruit is the most important character, that's really what we're breeding for. And so if we can screen and identify seedlings early on that have those uh, fruit, good fruit quality characteristics, um, then I think that's, that's a really useful move forward in the program. Um, I mentioned that we have we had these couple of markers, the ethylene regulation there uh, that just shows on the, the slide the ethylene pathway. Ethylene is a gaseous hormone that is involved in apple ripening. And we have identified a, a, a couple of allelic combinations of two key genes in that pathway, um, two key enzymes um, that enable us to, to select for seedlings that are more likely to store better and, and to retain their texture. So that's where we were pretty much with fruit quality markers until a couple of years ago. Um, back in 2009, uh, we got a USDA SCRI, Specialty Crops Research Initiative project funded that was led by Amy Iazoni at Michigan State University, the Rosebreed project. The whole focus of this project was to enable marker-assisted breeding in rosaceae, so not just apples, but a wider range of rosace rosaceous crops. And part of that was to identify more um, DNA tools to enable us to, to screen for fruit quality at an early stage. 
So we spend a, a lot of time phenotyping and then using a SNP array for genotyping a whole range of different quality traits. And with Apple, of course, we're talking fresh traits and also traits after storage. And we're now at the point where we can use uh, some of the DNA tools that we've developed for screening for crispness, juiciness, and acidity. And we're also just at the point of, of moving into single sugars as well. So I think in terms of fruit quality screening and DNA tools, we've moved on a long way in the last few years. So uh, that's the, the sort of first part, I guess, pre-phase one of the breeding program the bit before we get to see the fruit on the trees. <laughs> so phase one of my, of my program, this is the, the first time that we are actually getting seedling trees in the orchard uh, and, we can, and we can see fruit. As I mentioned before, these are on M9 rootstock, so they're on the dwarfing precocious rootstock. They're fairly closely spaced. Uh, they're about a foot apart. We do minimal pruning on these trees um, and we have as I put on there, about 24,000 trees in the ground in this phase at the moment. Um, that's that's big enough for my program. I don't want to have any more trees in the ground because managing that many is is about at our limit. What we do in this phase is select predominantly on appearance and then fruit quality. So. Uh, my team uh, and myself walk these ceilings uh, usually at least once a week throughout the season. So we're talking for us middle of August through to the end of October usually. And then we're, we're really looking for those apples that kind of jump out at us and say, pick me. Um, we don't certainly do not harvest uh, fruit from all 24,000 trees. Managing these orchards um, could be problematic, but in fact, uh, we have a system of barcoding that um, I introduced a few years ago now. So each tree has a unique barcoded label. Uh, what that enables us to do is when we've picked a fruit sample out in the orchard, we can just, uh, uh, when we're out there, we can scan the barcode and print a label immediately that goes onto the fruit sample. This really reduces our error possibility possibilities. Um, one of the worst things that you can do is to go through uh, a, a number of years of, of selection or looking at fruit um, and then go back and propagate from the wrong tree. Uh, and it has been done a number of times. So um, accuracy of labeling is vital. <laughs> For our fruit samples, all of them go through some cold storage. Typically, we store fruit at just refrigeration temperatures in air, air storage. We don't change the atmosphere in there at all. And we usually look at this phase of uh, just storing the fruit for two months and then putting them out for a week at shelf life, so room temperature shelf life after that. And that's really to kind of just mimic what many people do with their fruit uh, once they've bought it or, or at least the um, what happens to the fruit um, before you, you actually get to eat it as a consumer. One of the most difficult things with apple seedlings is gauging the right level of maturity to harvest the fruit. My program and, and many other programs uh, use a starch iodine index as an indication of maturity. Um, and it's pretty simple, you just uh, select an apple off the tree, uh, one that you think is representative of the maturity of the rest of the fruit on that tree. And believe me, within the tree you get a range of maturity as well. You then cut that apple in half, spray on some iodine solution, and then wait for the pattern to emerge, and then try your best to match that pattern with um, a chart similar to the one that you can see here. This is a chart that Cornell put together, um, and it's the one that we typically use in my program. We aim to try and pick fruit somewhere between about three and five on this scale. So we're aiming for four, but we'll go a little bit either way. Unfortunately, seedling by seedling, uh, you, you get different patterns of, of the, um, the, the starch iodine. And so it's never 
it was very difficult to be accurate on on using these these indices on seedling trees and of course it's destructive so one thing that we've been looking at is a different measure how can we we find something that that improves on this this DA meter is a, a meter that's come out of Italy was developed initially for use on peaches uh, that has been used on some apple varieties. We're currently looking at this. It, what it does is just to, to measure the fluorescence of the chlorophyll in the flesh just underneath the, the peel, so it measures through the peel. So it's non-destructive and you can actually use it, um, although the, the photograph shows it there being used in the lab, you can use it on the tree as well. So we're testing this out at the moment, but it, I'm really hopeful that it's going, to, it's going to work for us because it would be great to have the opportunity, first of all, to use a non-destructive measure, but also one that I hope will be perhaps a little bit more accurate than the starch iodine index. So once we've, uh, we've harvested our fruit and we've um, hopefully at the right level of maturity and we've got it back into the lab and we've done our two months of cold storage and our one week of shelf life, we do a whole range of different measures of, of quality. Um, first of all, we do a series of instrumental tests. We use our barcode system all the way through here and we have the lab set up now so that all of our instruments will just uh, enable us to scan the barcodes in and then dump data straight into Excel so we don't have to do any of that tortuous data entry and have the sort of errors that you typically get uh, from doing that. This in instrument is a more digitest. It's um, a little bit beyond a simple penetrometer. Um, so in other words, it has a probe. I think you can probably see in that photograph on the left that just pushes into the apple flesh, um, having, we usually peel it first, so it's it's peeled flesh rather than through the peel as well. Um, and this measures the, the resistance of the flesh, so it gives us a, an indication of the firmness of the apple, but it also gives us a measure of crispness. And we do this with a five fruit sample. We also then take uh, sections of the apples, uh, juice them, again using the barcodes to keep track of everything, and we test the juice for soluble solids content to give us an indication of sweetness. Um, and we also use uh, titratable acidity to measure the, acid the acidity of the juice, obviously. Um, and if you choose, you can actually store that juice in the freezer um, until you're ready to do it. Once we've done our uh, instrumental tests, we go through a whole range of uh, different sensory assessments. Um, we have a team of four of us and we all taste uh, every selection and then uh, we'll discuss a lot of them as well because um, sometimes uh, we disagree <laughs> as you'd probably imagine with four of us but I, I think that's, that's a positive thing. <laughs> we obviously produce a lot of data and one of the ways that we've dealt with this is that we've been lucky enough to be able to work with Dory Main and the team of the genome database for Rosaceae. And we have now a database that was specifically designed for my program, so it really helps us to, to kind of keep track of the data um, and to be able to compare data from one year to the next. So when we make selections from the first phase, we'll propagate up uh, five trees of each of those selections to go into three different sites. Two of these are grower sites and one of them is a WSU orchard. We also put in um, standard control varieties. We plant in randomized complete block designs. We have um, more than 40 advanced selections in this phase at the moment. And because we have bigger trees and more trees, it enables us to do some multiple pick dates. So as I said before, maturity gauging is the most difficult thing. So by doing multiple pick dates, in other words, we'll, we'll pick the same sample um, over a number of weeks, we can hopefully get a better indication of that maturity. And we test the fruit for four months as well as two months, just because we have some more fruit and we want to push that storage a little bit further. Here you can see the, the WSU orchard. Um, so the trees are more widely spaced, they're bigger trees, uh, so we'll get more fruit. 
because we have more fruit, we can move forward and do some more, more uh, sensory and consumer work. Uh, I work with Carolyn Ross, who's a food scientist at WSU. She has a trained sensory panel that really help us to kind of dissect the, the sensory traits of some of these selections. And then also, um, if there's something we're excited about, we'll move forward and do some consumer tests at this phase. So apples that are successful through this advanced stage move into our, our third phase. Um, here it's a, a bigger scale. We're at 75 trees per selection, four different grower sites. And all of these grower sites, um, each grower can use a different orchard system, so the system that they're most comfortable with. And the sites are spread uh, throughout the growing area of central Washington, uh, really to give us a, a good uh, indication of how well the different selections cope with the different environments. Uh, and the whole basis of this particular phase is that it, it enables us to have a large volume of fruit produced, so much, much more than we, we get from phase, th phase two, rather. And I work very closely with uh, some colleagues from the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission for this phase. They help me manage uh, and keep on top of those orchards because otherwise it would be a pretty impossible job just from the breeding team. Because we've got larger volumes of fruit, we can do a lot more testing um, and storage assessments are key for us. We again do sequential harvest, so we'll pick the fruit over a number of weeks. We do some testing with a chemical that's called 1-MCP, which is an ethylene receptor blocker that the industry uses now uh, a lot on, on certain varieties to, to help them to, to store fruit consistently. Um, so we test samples with and without 1-MCP. And then we also test samples in regular atmosphere storage, so typical cold storage, but just in air. And then also in what's called controlled atmosphere storage. So again, it's cold but the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide is controlled. And that, again, uh, enables the, the fruit to be stored for a longer period of time. So our fruit gets pretty widely tested. Um, we can do this because we work with one of our larger integrated grower packer shippers to Milt in town. Um, and they have some storage facilities that they, they um, let us use, and we have a very complicated system of samples at this point in time so it's great to have that that space and opportunity and with a larger volume of fruit we can do the sort of tests that the industry requires we can run fruit through commercial packing lines um, some apples fail miserably at this stage um, but uh, hopefully we're, we're looking for ones that succeed obviously and then we also test uh, waxing because uh, Washington fruit typically is waxed. And our large volume of fruit enables us to do more consumer tests. And we will do as much as the budget allows at this point in time. Um, you know, we need to get our fruit out there to the consumer and see what they think. So I'm pretty much at the end now. All I just wanted to kind of leave you with um, is that one of the fun aspects of working with Apple is the diversity that's expected by consumers and I think that's really nicely coined here um, in the term the plural nature of perfection this is something that Howard Moscovich put together and when he was describing ketchup but I think it works really well for Apple as well when you think about for example Granny Smith Red Delicious Honeycrisp um, any other variety that you can think of they're all very different, but each has um, a strong consumer following. So there are consumers that love them and there are consumers that hate them. <laughs> so for me, I think this, this whole plural nature of perfection is, is one of the great challenges of apple breeding. Uh, it just leaves me to um, acknowledge my team, uh, the group here at the uh, WSU, at the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center, um, my colleagues, uh, at the Tree Fruit Research Commission, and then also um, colleagues in main campus in Pullman. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions.